Hello, my name is Odrek Rawogo, and I'm running this message in response to several months of very deeply offensive online and FM radio stations lies propagated by some elements in the media and given a base to grow by some moderators and reporters on various channels. Some of these channels include Impact and Pal FM radio stations and some gutter YouTube sites. While I can complain directly to the faceless Western YouTube channel that has no interest in Africa other than, of course, dominating the minds of our young people, I prefer speaking directly in my own voice to my fellow Ugandans and African brothers and sisters, men of whom I work with and men of whom have heard these lies and continue to send me messages worried about the potential harm these fake voices may cause to my person, my family and the work we do. Now, I would like to use this opportunity not to fight back, as many have been asking me to, instead to teach and perhaps in the process to find some minimum ground with the people who spread this negativity. Most importantly, I want to reach out to you all who are listening to assure you that these fake voices purportedly attributed to me and the despicable content they carry, they are a lie from the pit of hell. Now, the term moderation in English can be equated to the roll and electric transformer unit, you know, transformers that you see on highways, on, on houses, on factories, transformers of electricity. The role they play in managing the flow of an electric current can be equated to the role a moderator plays in a, a talk show. The main role of a transformer is to step down the high voltage power and allow it to be consumed in a safe manner. A transformer unit tames excesses and surges, giving the right amount of wattage to the consumer. Now, if that analogy helps you, the moderators and reporters, to understand your role in communication, it is also telling of how much you have violated the fundamental principles and ethics of providing moderation in the media and how you've sadly abandoned the basics of reporting, such as the provision of facts and context to your listeners, in many of your shows. It seems to me that you want to go on air seeking to hurt, not to build. There are three principles I want to share with you today. And these three principles, for anyone who has had the privilege of being on air, and I call it a privilege because not many of us have the opportunity to, these principles you must preserve. To preserve a thing is to give it value and to stick with it long enough for it to make a difference in your life or in that of an institution you work with. These principles, instead you have blatantly uh, impelled on the wall of ignorance, and if it were not for the feeling that you probably don't know what you're doing, I would go after you at all levels. I would seek due recompense so as to make up for the injustice you've persistently fostered on me by allowing a concocted, deliberately fabricated voice purported the mind to run on your stations. Here are the three principles. Perhaps you can use them to train your reporters and moderators to exercise due care. The first principle is called the principle of attribution. The principle of attribution. When someone on air attributes or mentions a statement or gives out a piece of information about another party not on air, the moderator the reporter must help listeners to separate fact from fiction, truth from lies, by interrogating in a very firm and impartial manner the source of that statement. Why do you do that as a moderator or a reporter? Because information is food for the brain. The listeners make their minds up by making points of reference to the name this statement is attributed to. It is called issue framing in communication. Now, when a statement is not provable, it has no right to stand in a public forum. It should be discarded and an apology given immediately. It does not even have to wait for a disclaimer at the end of the show. It should be recanted immediately for its source is dubious. Now that you could repeatedly run a fake voice attributed to me and not even bother to call me, to find out whether indeed this was Audrey Ruhawogo's voice, my voice, is beyond my comprehension. It is a sign 
of irresponsibility for someone moderating a program, and even worse, even worse, it casts a long shadow on the very station's values. Some people think that this kind of behavior by people in the media is just simply a reflection of the press freedom in our country today. They quote the hundreds of radio stations that are existing in our country as if quantity replaces values and quality. No, I see it differently. I don't see this as freedom. I see it rather as a sign of potential anarchy if the citizens and our social and political institutions do not arrest this trend very soon. Now, by not questioning various concocted voices spoken with a particular ethnic slant, a slant deliberately meant to distort people's thinking, a slant you know, meant to cause disaffection and anxiety against a particular group of people, you not only endangered the reputation of an innocent private citizen, but even more, even more, you failed in your duty to shine a light on an injustice fostered on a community. By your omission of what is legitimate radio protocol, you gave platform not just to falsehood, but you also actively promoted a stereotype about an ethnic group. When I heard these manufactured voices, I call them manufactured in quotes, I was reminded that for many of our elite, the people in ties and suits running our businesses, running government in radio houses, perhaps these elites, they have not had history. History has not been a good teacher for them. You know, I have recorded this voice note today, coincidentally, on a very particularly important historical day in the life of our nation. On June 15th, in the year 1891, Captain Frederick Lugard, a stranger, a fortune hunter, an invader, searching for gold, diamonds, ivory, and territorial control for his franchise, the franchise they, they, they used to call the Imperial British East African Company. On this day, he crossed the Kazinga Channel, that little piece of land between Lakes Mwit and Zije, which we call Albert in English, and Masioru, or the one sometimes they call Rweru, although Rweru sometimes is used uh, for Lake Victoria by the people of Karagwe. He crossed that little piece of island between Masioro and Mwitanzije. He had a band of raiders ab numbering about 200. They were composed of Zanzibaris, of the Nyamwezis, of Sudanese mercenaries, and some local guides. Lugard successfully attacked and dislodged a small force of Omukama Kavalega of Bunyoro from that channel, and he took control of Katwe salt mines, which then was a huge prize for many long-distance traders. But a few months to this act, to this day, Lugard had, had been gladly seen off in Kampala by some of the leaders of Buganda Kingdom, and he crossed through Budu area. He picked up Kasagama, a prince from Toro, who he planned to use against Kavalega, and he arrived in Nkore, where he was welcomed with warm hands and a blood brotherhood ceremony. In just under a year, Lugard, a foreigner, with no prior knowledge of these areas he was walking through, simply by using trickery, mercenary action, raiding, and capitalizing on our parochial differences among leaders and community, communities, he had almost the entire Uganda signed away to his company and to his country, Britain. To say it in a much more categorical way, he ate us piece by piece due to our differences. Two years later, Kavalega, even with his lack of a generally thought-out uniting national ideology and with his crude organizational tactics, he tried single-handedly to force back the invaders out of what would later be Uganda, but he lacked support of other leaders. They would not put their differences aside and rally to the cause to mobilize peasants against foreign invasion. Now, many of the leaders sadly fell in bed with the invaders simply to gain a tactical advantage over their neighbors with whom they had had a few acrimonious relations. They did not see the big picture of the total loss of sovereignty in their land in the end for all of them. 
Some things are important to me. That's why I give you context. For example, when Kabalega reconquered Toro in early 1893, and he did what in the army they call a pincer movement by simultaneously sending an expeditionary force across the Nile and he overran Busoga to the east and encircled the invaders in central and southern Uganda. No one came to his aid. Nobody. Nobody seemed to want to chase away Colonel Colville's bands of raiders who the latter had simply mobilized from Sudan and Zanzibar. He didn't even know them. Just a band of raiders taking over East Africa. Kabalega had gained a strategic advantage over the invaders by encircling them. But he could not press home to victory because he lacked popular support from the very communities and leaders he was fighting in because he was perceived as, in quotes, enemy. On the 2nd of March, in the year 1895, when his forces, Kabalega's forces, gained a tactical, and I should say a psychological advantage over the invaders at the Battle of Kajumbera Island, I suspect this battle was either on Lake Kyoga or River Kafu. I'm speaking to the remaining elders of Bunyoro to confirm this location. On this day, 2nd of March 1895, Kabalega capsized two of the five canoes that were carrying four white officers. Their names were Mr. Dunning, Mr. Cunningham, Mr. Vandela, and Mr. Ashburnham. These four British officers had 2,000 militia of local Baganda regulars, Sudanese, Zanzibaris, and some Indians, and they had two strategically located Maxim guns mounted on platforms on the bank of the water and firing repeatedly at Kabarega's forces. In a battle between modern technology and a somewhat courageous African leader, Kabarega forced a hasty retreat of the white man in the early hours of that morning on March the 2nd, 1895. Both the officer Dunning and the officer Cunningham were severely injured. And the former, Mr. Dunning, died of his battle wounds later. Even with this psychological advantage, no local leader saw this hugely symbolic gesture of an African force reading the country of these new invaders. Instead, our forefathers could not bring themselves to stand together as a people who shared linkages of over 500 years and fight as one force against a common invading enemy. Never mind that all these people being separated by these shallow differences that the white man capitalized on, all these people came from at least, as history tells us, one ancestry at the end of the Batrezi Empire in the year 1500. Our unity and history had been so strong that even even with the Luo invasion from the Nubian highlands in Sudan and the end of the Chesi rulership, the Luo Bito kings and their headmen had to accept and adapt to the culture they found in this area in order to flourish and govern. Therefore, today, when I see educated people with a very short memory, because 130 years ago, when Lugat was doing all this, it's just simply five generations. It is very recent. Today, people trying to divide us based on tribes, and faking voices, as if the voice of a person explains their character, their experience, their behavior, their actions, and you in the media giving these retrogressive expressions an open forum, I feel very compelled to remind you that you ought to study and learn from history. Let it be your teacher. Do not fight a brother because by doing so, you play in the hands of a larger global invader. Those invaders haven't changed character. They have only shed their skin. They want us kept divided and weak so that Africa and our countries are their playground. For example, in many in the Western world today, we will not tolerate a rising Uganda or the unit of East Africa because our rise and our unity will necessarily push for a geographical, geopolitical space and a voice for our continent. These forces must, out of their age-old selfish interest, by trickery, by trinkets, they must want to keep us engaged 
in tribal, religious, homosexuality debates, Western forms of democracy. These conversations are not the type, they very rarely deal with the core issues of trade and investment, the true and greater security of the African peoples, the socioeconomic change of millions of peasants in our country and Africa that are badly needed, that is socioeconomic change that is badly needed. They, the quality of leaders we need, regardless of where they come from, all these things are never talked about by these entrenched interests. We simply play in their hands. Now, let me tell you something. I have in all of my life, and I am now 51 years old, and therefore not young, so I know something or two about country, about building an enterprise, about dealing with people. I have in all of my life refused to be drawn into fights about individuals or talking about individuals, for I know that this is a very debased and depressing conversation if you take that route. I really believe that a man must meet another at an idea level and you win or lose the argument at that level. Not at the level of where does one someone come from or what they ate last night. As I hear, you know, a lot on many of your shows. I can give you one example. In 2015, when some of the leaders in the NRM took away my right to participate in an electoral process, in an electoral exercise to which I was entitled, to which I had a right, they were citing religious and tribal connotations as if anyone chooses where they are born or, or as if a birthplace means one gets low or high brain cells. I completely refused to be drawn into those shallow debates. Why? Because I know very well what matters for the greater good of our unity and our country. That's why I don't answer that garbage that you hear on social media. Because I have learned from history to forgive and to work hard at wherever God has placed me and what he has given me to do for that day. Just to conclude this point, I want the listener to think counterfactually. What if Kabalega had beaten off all the offensives of the white man and all the tribal leaders had come to his aid and worked together regardless of their petty differences? What would we have been as a project in national unity and state building? Hmm. I can only speculate. We, we cannot accurately tell, but we can point in order to understand that China, China was militarily weak and technologically backward, but it was so united at a culture and values level. Those two traits, among other circumstances, helped China to fend off for over 100 years the deep and worst forms of incursions into her territory by the Western powers till it was able to stand up again in October 1949. Therefore, my brothers and sisters in the media, while I understand uh, that the media itself, as well as Western arts, entertainment, law, while I understand they're still young and information and very much a function of social and economic progress, you have no excuses as reporters, and moderators not to exert yourselves and to do the best you can to keep our young country growing, keep our young country strengthening together. Perhaps many of us shoot straight from peasantry into the newsrooms and we do not care to learn. And this is the reason we permit these kinds of fabricated stuff on air. No, I want to ask you, we should disabuse ourselves of this habit of shallow views and shallow surface analysis of building a nation. As a news forum, you should be a seeker of truth, not a purveyor of lies. My deepest concern is that when you broadcast in this negative manner I have been hearing, you irretrievably damage honest political discourse that our country needs today. You promote disinformation as a basis for decision making for many people, and you undermine the growth of a harmonious society. I want to tell you that it takes partners to build a better country and you should stand high among those partners as media houses. I have belabored the point of attribution in order to give you context and perhaps a deeper understanding of its importance. The second principle you violated is that of objectivity. Objectivity. Every human being I have met, including myself, has some form of bias given how and where they grew up 
and what shaped their early thinking. This is why you have superstitious people often dressed in modern clothing, but their thoughts and actions so medieval and anti-progress. These days it is even more difficult because we live in a society with very fast information up to the minute and often that information is simply rumors dressed in brightly decorated colors so attractive to a very itchy ear. Now as moderators and reporters, you owe it to your listeners to fact check what is brought to you. The rule is to do a minimum of five times of checking, five times of checking, five times of checking in order to confirm or reject its authenticity. Why must you do this? Because objectivity and truth are absolute ground zero for hard work and stamina in reporting. It isn't for the lazy reporters and moderators. I want to ask you, you must put a freeze to your personal feelings, biases and opinions and those of your guests because they really do not matter. What matters is impartiality and facts. Impartiality and facts. Somehow, one of you in the management of one of the radio stations was a little honest with, with me when I called her on hearing these voices. She said to me that they host this gentleman called Mr. Milundi, vulgar and abusive as he is, because he apparently is somewhat popular with the audiences. Hmm. I was taken aback, but I was not entirely surprised that in these stations there is a very deliberate blurring of lines between what is true and factual and what is clearly misleading and lying and it is termed as popular. If a family or an institution is run by what is popular and less by what is principled and true, that family or institution risks a very negative harvest. If you are a purveyor of a public good like a radio station, I want you to picture yourself as a public water well. In a particular part of our country recently that I was visiting, I walked by what was supposedly a protected water well that most of the villagers in the community used. I instead found people had defecated around it, one side, while on the northern side, some were happily fetching water for domestic use, while others washed motorbikes, vehicles with oil, along with their clothing. Now that kind of water well can only set a stage for disease in that community. Likewise, a station purveying unchecked information and lies poisons an entire community. There is a station in one of our neighboring countries in 1994, you know, that should be your example. Whenever you press these borderlines, you ought to be careful. Third and final principle that you violated is called the principle of honesty. 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 When you allow the airing of speech that is intended to sustain a false belief, speech that is disingenuous, speech that is deeply insincere and outrightly deceptive, you as a reporter or the moderator of the program are seeking to drive a wage in our society. You are seeking to separate people, even if you might not see the immediate effect. You are seeking to destroy relationships and to harm a nation in the long run. In some of these stations where these voices have been running, I have very deeply embedded relationships <laughs> built over many years. I have respect for owners of these stations. I have even appeared on these stations before, and my voice is very well known. But by you allowing dishonest speech, you undermine these relationships and you force court battles and injunctions, the very things I never like to do because of the greater good of our unity as a people. Dishonesty, gentlemen and ladies in the media, is a cancer cell. And all it needs is a host. Cancers are parasites that only need hosts to create a symbiotic relationship. This relationship is self-serving for both the host and the visitor. Without a host, there is no multiplication of cancer cells. Therefore, if you host a liar, you the moderator and the station are as good as that liar. And under normal circumstances, you should be held accountable for what is said, what is aired, unless you recant it. Next time I have an opportunity again to share with you, I will shed more light on why I think some of these liars that you host, what motivates them to do what they are doing against innocent people. But for now, 
I hope you can correct this mistake. You can make use of these principles I've shared with you. And you can make a public apology unreservedly for what you did. And we shall all move on. I thank you. My name again is Odrek Ruabogo. I am a farmer. I am an entrepreneur. I am a teacher of national collective values. And I thank you very much. Bye-bye.